get on board Mr. Nawal Ahuja, once again, the co-founder and director of Exchange for Media for a few question and answer round that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Himan, for a very crisp to the point and uh, insightful 15, 20 minutes. Uh, uh, typical Himan, very direct, very honest and uh, straightforward. It, it's good to see you. Hopefully, uh, we'll catch up soon. So, Himan, uh, uh, over the next 20 minutes or so, what I'd like to do is uh, ask you a few questions about you know what's happening around us. And uh, I'd like to uh, sort of bucket the conversation in two parts. One is about you know what's happening with the digital, uh, you know, technology space and how it is impacting, you know, the FMCG business per se. And the other part is what's happened with COVID and how companies are responding to that. Specific, specifically, companies like yours, FMCG companies, uh, the role of leadership when it comes to COVID. Let me first start with the technology piece, and you know, here uh, I thought we'll uh, make it simpler if I if we talk about you know the three legs on which. Uh, a company stands when it comes to digital technology. One obviously is uh, the transformation that you know you are the internal transformation you're doing, right? To make your company uh, more relevant to today's time, uh, making sure that all pieces are sort of you know seamlessly working together, and you're using the technology backbone significantly. The other part is the external facing part where you are looking at you know how to uh, do a better customer reach out to your sales channels. You spoke about. ITC stores, you spoke about the e-commerce part. And the third part obviously is using digital as a marketing tool. You know, you spoke about how when you started your career and that's a marketer's, you know, a CMO's holy grail about, you know, how to measure uh, sales success through, uh, you know, uh, the spends that are going in marketing. So let me ask you on the first sort of uh, leg, you know, FMCG companies as, uh, you know, they, the brands, these companies were built over the last 30, 40, 50 years. And the digital uh, disruption has been very sudden and, you know, very fast, especially in the last 18 months. What are the three, four things you've done internally, right, to make the company sort of uh, digital tech ready? Because this is a space where, you know, as you yourself mentioned, you don't, time is not on your side. Time is not an advantage. You know, you react, you have to react very fast. It has democratized uh, uh, you know, the playing field, so to say, for all companies. So what are the three, four things you've done, which has uh, sort of, how does that transformation look like from inside ITC Foods? Tell us a bit about that. You know, I think, um, uh, well, you know, when you actually, when you look at transformation from outside, it looks as if something major has happened. When you're inside, actually the evolution is taking place. And the evolution is very, very rapid, certainly. But I think the high quality talent is also able to absorb the changes much faster. But having said that, you need to create the backbone as well. And it does require investment to take place, right? If you want to create that backbone, you have to have the willingness to try newer things. And I think to that extent, we have been, uh, you know, fairly ahead of the curve, or at least, you know, in contemporary with large number of uh, maybe a few other uh, companies. And as I talked about in terms of setting up our social media monitoring system, the customer data hub, you know, uh, so we've been, we've been doing that. We work very closely in terms of a lot of uh, analytics that is coming in place. And I think, you know, I didn't talk much about that part of it because I focus much more on the digital marketing piece per se. But when you actually look back in terms of overall you know, marketing and when you look at your ROIs and when you look at what investment to make between this medium, this whether I'm spending on television or on digital or on consumer promotions or on trade promotions, because each of them actually play with each other. And there and, and today, you know, we, we've uh, you know you have sales data which comes in from from your general trade stores. You have modern trade sales data. So there are many sources of data, ACLs and data. You have the data. You have got the inputs. You can measure some of the inputs. And then, how are you going to make sure that you get the best uh, bang for your bucks? because that is going to be uh, all, always challenging. The other thing I think from a transformation perspective is that there's a lot of learning that is coming from small brands, you know, from their agility, right? From their ability to carve uh, niches. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, uh, it's, it's for us to kind of respond very quickly. Uh, today, you know, um, there was this period of time when, um, do will consumer believe that, you know, I can't trust big brands kind of a thing. And therefore I want to look at, you know, specialized brands. 
but i think the the the, the d2c options or e-commerce options allows you to create brands which are available and and you know because what you have is a great supply chain because newer players smaller players will find it always very difficult to compete with the supply chain which is fairly you know uh, well oiled which makes sure that you know your your cost of manufacture remains sharp and therefore you are able to you know get that done so i think transformation also comes in in terms of uh, understanding uh, the consumer uh, how inciting is taking place and i think that's a very very uh, important point of to look at in terms of how quickly can you get that information how quickly can you convert them into into product and solutions and communication solutions yeah i think uh, you know the backbone of digital transformation one of the backbones is data so data is you know uh, used abused misused sort of commodity in today's world uh, but you know like you mentioned uh, the example about how ashirwad data sales in delhi 50 20% were coming from ecom and the marketing team at that time was not aware so what do you do now today for example to ensure that data is uh, available real time is what really makes uh, a huge amount of difference because uh, yeah. that uh, quickens your speed in terms of how you react to what's happening in the market uh, absolutely and i think we have a, a pretty sharp uh, set of people doing the uh, background data analytics which is made you know so there are enough empty number of dashboards available to people right where you can see whether you are whether you look at availability with and then today when i look at ecom you know you've got uh, a lot of other yeah, i'm saying amazon itself gives out so much of data in terms for you to be able to actually consume and see what you can do with it and i think that's quite fascinating because you learn so much uh, you know which you did not which you, you could not learn earlier because when you go into a normal store you put some point of sale you put some promotion you don't know exactly what you know it takes its time to come in but today that learning is very very fast and your ability to try uh, make mistakes is also uh, becomes uh, very very fast but i think uh, the the part about data is also uh, two things i would say democratization it should be available to everybody and simplicity to understand yes because sometimes you have so many of these tableau dashboards and they give you so much information and say yaar what do i have to do with this finally let me tell me what action i need to take so i think that becomes uh, because you know i can't just burden pe- people with you know more and more data i think the 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 uh, what the essence out of it so that one can take action about it and measure that action is most critical absolutely simple actionable data is a very important aspect you spoke a lot about human uh, about people you know uh, for talent is one of the key aspects uh, every company has and as we spoke about you know digital having sort of uh, pushed companies to transform at a very sort of short notice uh, companies like yours work with top notch talent but somewhere there is al- al- always inertia to change right uh, especially when you have competitors who are more nimble smaller faster moving they are thinking much faster bigger companies sort of are like massive ships which take their time to turn around tell us a little bit about you know uh, Uh, the aspects of you know talent and people how do you manage that during a transformation like this because there are two parts to it one is when you hire younger people they are you know are more knowledgeable than their you know bosses so that's one part of the story where you said you know training comes in and the other part is the market is changing at a certain pace and the talent you have is uh, perhaps still rooted in uh, what they sort of the training they went through 15 20 years back and this creates a kind of you know a situation where to turn that ship around in a you know digital economy is kind of a very challenging job yeah absolutely novel absolutely true and i think um, i i i don't want to be unfair to my uh, to my team uh, because i think that evolution has happened right and and nothing works better than success right and i know that it took some time and i know that you know when my head of digital um in fact um, yeah, uh, you know i i when 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 she joined us to me i had to be the sponsor of it so i think that onus is on the leadership because you also have to give the comfort to people that don't worry if it doesn't work i'm there to take the blame you don't have to take the blame you only take the blame if you don't try so i think that in in a system sometimes that fear of failure uh also um, you know restricts people from uh, from 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 doing it at the same time i find that challenging you know uh, the team uh, also works very well right because you know uh, the youngster will be very embarrassed to figure out that this you know 50 plus year old man knows something more than him 
in this space. And therefore, to me, that that is you, you challenge and then you get some phenomenal response because, you know, uh, what I may think about one, they'll come back with five, five new ideas. I might have one. But I think that uh, and, and I, I, one more thing that works very well, I find, is that when you put people into cross-functional groups, right, because different ideas start coming in. And, and how do you create a culture where, you know, people are free to kind of express themselves? It's not easy, you know, in a legacy organization, these things takes a little time. But I think that's what the only job of uh, leadership is. Yeah, I think very important. Uh, allow people, in fact, push them to take risks and give them the comfort that, you know. Uh, and as I was saying that, you know, there was a time I said, no, you have to spend this money. Now, I know there are smart people, they will not waste the money. Yeah, that's right. right. I'm saying I'm only going to make sure that you have to spend so much percentage on digital, right? That was a few years back. And when they spent it, and then you discovered something new which has happened, and that becomes the story. So you also have to pick up small successes and really advertise them. Yes. Right. And saying, you know, this team has done this. Have you thought about it? You know, why don't you do it? And, and, and I think today, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's significantly, I think we are quite there. Uh, having said that, we may think we are quite there, but things are changing so fast now. They change, you know, so that you, you know, what, you know, in, in, in our traditional marketing era, things would change once in two years. Out here, things change once in two months. So I think that is a constant, you know, you can't just uh, let yourself slip. Yes. Uh, let me come to, uh, you know, the your sector, your industry, specifically Hemant, and talk about the SMCG business. Tell us, uh, what is what is the fundamental change in the product mix that you are sort of selling? Uh, has the digital business brought in? Have you seen anything, say, over the last two years, uh, as e-commerce uh, sales have picked up, as delivery and supply and uh, sales push through uh, digital and technology have picked up? Have you seen any significant change, any trends that have emerged when it comes to the product mix that you're pushing out? And uh, a follow-up to that is that, how does that change or that impact your uh, market reach out efforts in terms of you know, your marketing uh, strategy? I think, um, yes, there is a change in the mix because the mix that you sell in a general trade versus a mix that you sell on e-com is different. Uh, uh, yes, there may be 200 million shoppers or 60 million shoppers, whatever they are, maybe today those numbers, they are a little more premium shoppers, at least in these platforms. You may find a little more value conscious as far as grocery is concerned, but when it comes to Flipkart, Amazon, even in Big Basket, people are there, they, they have more time to experiment. Your search uh, helps them to find out about a little more about your product, your A plus content showcases in terms of what all can happen with your product. So for a lot of the premium products, for a lot of the convenience products, right? For instance, when I look at, uh, you know, uh, uh, cooking paste, for instance, this was a big uh, change that happened in this last one year, people at home wanting to cook. And, and we launched our cooking pace for ITC MasterChef cooking pace, where you were, you also build in terms of how to cook because there was a set of people who don't were not very comfortable cooking. So that's the audience that is coming in. So 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 when I look at you know when I look at organic, uh, you know we launched Ashirwad organic. It sells mostly on e-com. So it allows you a platform to come up with you know more innovative, more differentiated products. At the same time, of course, your large sellers will remain large sellers in this platform as well. But the, the pack size can change. You know, you will sell a 200 rupee pack instead of a 30 rupee pack or 120 rupee pack. So the pack size changes. So that is another change that, 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 that happens. And I think uh, it allows you to experiment much more. Right. It allows you to launch newer products because first while you would have assumed, you know, if I launch this, it's a niche product, which outlet will I sell it? So I think that that uh, but having said that, it's it's an op opportunity which is available to everybody. It's not unique only to, to us. And therefore, to that extent, how well you understand the platform becomes more critical. Yeah, I think what it is doing is it is allowing companies to take risks because the sort of downside is uh, not huge. On the other hand, what it is doing is because it is democratizing the system for everyone, everybody is free to do that. You know? So every company can quickly do that without, uh, you know, uh, making... But, but I think it's quite challenging and, uh, you know, in interesting times, I would say, not challenging for the, uh, for, for inside teams, for product development teams yeah. to, 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 you know, I'm saying you get feedback so quickly, right? You, 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 somebody says, this is the part of your launch. I didn't like it. I didn't have a problem with your packaging. I had, and you can change very quickly as well, right? So... Right. Yeah. 
So before I come to, you know, how you use digital media as a sort of marketing platform, let me ask you now, given the rise of, you know, e-commerce and technology-led sales and the subsequent change in, say, the uh, product mix or the packet sizing, have you also uh, re-looked at your marketing approach in terms of how do you want to reach out to consumers as opposed to an earlier era when sales would primarily be driven by the sort of, you know, either the Kirana stores or the large format retailers? Yeah, of course, uh, a lot has changed. In fact, something more interesting is also, I'm observing. you know, when this uh, spends on digital, when I look at, and one is to digital for the, you know, for awareness creation, top of the funnel, versus spend on digital when it comes in terms of purchase, which is what, what happens at the, at the e-com platforms. I'm finding almost 30, 40% of the spends are moving towards this part of it. You know, where you can actually, you identify your cohorts and you make sure that you create such offers or some, some options or products which can actually go in. So that, so not only is there a change, which is in terms of how your, um, you know, money could have changed uh, from, from traditional versus digital um, uh, in terms of portfolio, how the portfolio would have changed. But I think within that also, there is a change which has happened. Right. And I think that is quite uh, a, a, quite an interesting observation. Yeah, I mean, very interesting part because, you know, uh, uh, marketers talk about, you know, legacy media, uh, the likes of television, print being useful more for brand building and using digital more for lead generation and sort of, you know, point of purchase sales and, you know, ROI driven metrics. And uh, a lot of digital platforms are now trying to also move in the sort of first bucket where they're talking about, you know, how, uh, digital can also be used for the larger, you know, brand building objectives and not just used for the second part. But uh, I see com companies like yeah. CGF sort of been dabbling in both parts. And naturally, the the sort of sales, the ROI driven part, uh, as of now has more value, delivers more value, delivers significant value. Let me come to the, you know, uh, uh, you know, the other part of the discussion that I wanted to have with you, which is about, you know, what's happened. Uh, around us in the last 18 months, uh, Heyman, you've led a, you admirably, admirably led a large company for many years. The role of uh, a CEO has been, uh, you know, very challenging in the last 18 months. Uh, you look at the pandemic, what it did to society, our co-workers, colleagues, individuals, companies, uh, naturally different companies responded differently. Tell us uh, as a CEO, what are the few sort of, how is Heyman Malik, uh, different from what you were 18 months back when it comes to the role you run? And what are the companies that you've seen around you, which sort of you look up to and say that these are the companies that really stood out in terms of how they handle the impact of the pandemic really well, both from a business point of view and also in terms of you know, their sort of impact on society and, uh, uh, and, and people at large? So I think uh, uh, from, the, from the perspective of impact on society perspective, I think, uh, ITC and under the leadership of our chairman, uh, this is an area which has been of focus for ITC always, right? Uh, and I think when 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 pandemic hit us uh, last year, uh, it was a you know very simple transformation that okay, this is something that is that the company has to look at. Um, the the actions that were done last year were a little different than what had to be done this year. Uh, last year, it was more about, uh, you know, looking at in terms of support to people, to migrants, support to, you know, relief funds and stuff like that. This year, it was in terms of coming up in place in terms of need for oxygen, need for concentrators, you know, we, we repurposed to, uh, you know, we, we, when we just realized that one of the snack plant makes, uh, you know, uh, we fill nitrogen in our, uh, you know, bingo potato chips and, and you release the oxygen out of it. So if you were to repurpose it, you can actually convert them into an oxygen plant. And so, you know, the team did that. We converted one in Kapoorthala, we'd converted one in, in, in Monget, until such time that the other uh, orders that ITC had done uh, would come in. There was a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, for, for your own employees, for your larger ecosystem, you know, almost 100,000 people in some way or the other in our distribution systems, in our factory systems, in our logistics system. So to, 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 to look at that and to, and to protect that, uh, Personally, I think this time around uh, was more somber and I personally don't think this was one of those where you can take credit about the CSR work because whatever you do is not enough. 
right? So I, therefore, I don't want to talk too much about it, you know, <laughs> because whatever is there is, is is has to be done, and that's part of your responsibility. So there's no about talking about it. Okay. Coming to in terms of sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, coming terms so in terms of about the business part of it, right? And in terms of there were two phases. Last year was a phase, and this year was a phase from a business perspective. Last year was a very very different phase from a you know the 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 uh, everything was shut but foods was um, supposed to be essential services so we had to get our factories going in as quickly as possible uh, we had to work with every state government to convince that these are all essential products so allow it to get manufactured you have to work uh, to make sure that your logistics can happen and most importantly the fear factor was way higher last time than it was this time around right and how to motivate how do you make sure that your people are coming to the factories to, to run the factory, factory. You know? and, and and you know everybody else is working from home how do you make you know how do you still motivate people to to, to be there um in fact uh, on the side i have never stopped coming to office so that was in my mind one of the things that you know um so i've always you know because i'm essential services so i can i can come to work uh and and i think there, if you were to say, how did Himan change at that point of time? I think there was a change that I realized there was not enough time for participative decision making. Right, that was a time where you had to take decisions immediately. So we had groups, and you had to take a call, and you were working from six o'clock to twelve o'clock in the night. You had to make sure that, and and we had a phenomenal time. I think we 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 sold the highest that we could, that whatever we could make, we could sell. Uh, but that was a difference for those three months there was like complete you know one one decision one voice simple go ahead and move i think this time around it is uh, you know you're back to normal because supply chains haven't got disrupted some stores did shut down you know so to that extent some on the go consumption got impacted but uh, you know from a business perspective this was uh, you know fairly almost routine yeah so some some markets got impacted because they were shut for a longer period of time but last year was a different uh, experience a growing up experience for you know everybody fantastic very honest uh, and straightforward reply himant and before uh, you go i can't let you go without uh, talking about social media and its, its impact on you know brands and marketing and we've seen so much that's happened around us in the last few years you know uh, tell us uh, you know brands walk a very thin line between being value driven and taking a very sort of conscious stand about things versus capitulating to criticism and sort of bullying so to say and we live in a, unfortunately for good or bad we live in a world which is very polarized opinion wise politically and so on and so forth uh, what is your view on you know how uh, brand should navigate a mild this minefield called social media because there is no running away not being on social media is not the choice anymore right so what what is your view as a as a marketer and as the ceo of a large fmcg company what's your view on what what your advice would be to a cmo today who is sitting in the hot seat so uh novel it's a tough question then you've kept it for the last uh, you know i think uh, do do brands want to walk the line where they take positions for that it depends upon the brand's dna and what the brand is trying to differentiate itself with right uh, yeah, uh, so so if you are a, one of those cutting edge brands which want to be in that conversation certainly you'll have to take those risks right and i think uh, social media is also a lot of noise after some time it really doesn't you know the noise you know you have to brave it for 3 days and then something else will come up having said that we have uh, actually experienced the negative in terms of uh, you know rumors around the product right and that was about 2 years back uh, on ashirwad one of our our biggest brands that there is plastic in the art i know you know plastic costs much more than wheat does but how can I, uh, but this was the that was the kind of a rumor that came in and actually i saw that you know the sales just collapsed in 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 hyderabad for instance and i could see that like from you know people are scared about buying it because there is a rumor so when that happened you had to come up front you had to you know uh, we you know to some extent uh, you know this debate about uh, um you know uh, in terms of uh, I, i'll give you an example uh, you know somebody puts up a video on facebook we go, we have to go to the court we get a court order because it's a false video we take it down and after 3 days somebody else puts up the same video and you go back and say please pull it down this is no need to get another court order so you have to go back to the court to get court orders after court orders so so those are some of the challenges that happen and i hope that with with the new laws that are coming in at least some of these fake news should get uh, you know 
address it. Though they don't have to be uh, such a painful, uh, painful process. That's right. Thank you, Hemant. Thank you for your time today. I hope the pandemic is behind us uh, very soon and we are able to do this face to face. Uh, back to you, Kathy, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the sessions. Thanks for taking time out. Hemant. Thank you. Thank you, Naval. Thank you, and wish you all the best to your session. Naval, always a pleasure to speak with you and your team. Thank you so much, Mr. Malik and Mr. Ahuja for that wonderful conversation.